This Chinese American writer says that she does not recognize the China that she grew up visiting. And so basically we want to ask, is China actually changing for the worse or for the better? Let's discuss. You know, things are kind of slowing down after decades of incredible growth, but it's crazy because the technology is there, but maybe people are feeling disenchanted. Uh, we got to talk about this article from New York Times by Jish Jen. She's from Shanghai, uh, born there, but then she is an American novelist and she wrote, this isn't the China I remember. So long story short, she talks about this incredible rise of China all the excitement, you know, they didn't have things in 1979. And then it goes through this crazy boom. Everybody's super looking forward to the future. China's about to become the world's number one economy. It still might, but she's saying the last five years and after the lockdowns, people are starting to feel very disenchanted and people are leaning into almost like giving up, which is like Tangping or Bai Lan because they feel like all their work is like ultimately not worth outputting mm. for the result and the success that they're getting. All right, guys, we're going to go through the comments section, but we're going to give our own thoughts as Chinese Americans. Uh, but yeah, let us know your thoughts down below. If you have any insight, please hit that like button. Check out other episodes of the Hot Pot Boys. You can buy Smala Sauce at smalasauce.com right now. Real quick, I just want to show one video of how China used to look in like the 1990s, for example, and how it looked in 2020. It's time to time travel and watch China's emergence as a global superpower taking the scale of change. This is China then and now. Boom, as you can see, Andrew, it is probably on a massive level, probably the craziest, I guess, economic come up on a widespread scale that the world has ever seen. Oh, yeah. And it feels like, and I guess, if it is true, that uh, it feels like as quickly as China was able to rise out of poverty and do all these great things and become the superpower, make every the world's items, make everything in the world. The world's factory, right? Yeah, and be the world's factory. Uh, also... Their kind of like slowdown seems to, and again, I'm not on the ground in China. I don't live there currently, but it seems like that that disenchanted attitude of giving up Bailan, Tanping is growing pretty fast. So I, I guess uh, what are some other parts of the article that are important? And then, uh, yeah, let's, let's give yeah. our takes. So basically... She starts out in 1979, Andrew. The, the Nanjing hospital didn't even have Band-Aids. Wow. So people were super excited that the West has everything. So over the next couple decades, China has an economic boom. They start getting stuff like Band-Aids and stuff like that. They're starting to be like, man, China got everything. If we, if, we, if we don't got it, we can import it or we just make it domestically within our own borders. But over the past five years, she's saying that a lot of people are starting to feel like, dang, I don't know if Shanghai is as good as it was in like 2015 mm. in 2025 is going to be like maybe a little bit worse than 10 years ago, even though the technology is better and the streets are cleaner. Yeah. She also mentions like just from a person to person standpoint, she remembers in Shanghai when I think Shanghai, like, you know, let's say 20 years ago, it was lauded as like the city. It's been the city in China, kind of like the cool city in China where Everybody was super polite. The workers would hand her credit card back with two hands. They would like look out. They were just, they had a little bit more, I guess, like care to their job. Mm. But now she's saying when she goes back to Shanghai, she feels like people just do not give a crap about their job. And that yeah. also, by the way, customer service getting worse. Also something that they're saying happens in America too. I've noticed that myself. Right, right, right. There's a lot of implications for late, late stage capitalism globally around the world. Her last uh, thing, well, she obviously goes through some government policies that she felt like led to this Tangping Bailan, basically young people opting out of the workforce, essentially being like, it's not worth it for me to like dedicate 30, 40 years as something that's mm. not even going to give me success or the happiness I want. She says, however... Things could change in China. Those that are lying flat are not asleep. They are watching and could someday rise up. But in the meantime, the people in Shanghai are simply put Xin Lei, meaning uh, Xin is heart, Lei is tired. Andrew, their hearts are tired. Mm, maybe it's a lot of disappointment. David, what do you think? Do you agree or could you see, you know, how this is true based off 
you know, what we know. Yes, yes, yes. If we look at macroeconomic factors, Andrew, they had like, what, 7% growth in China for like many, many years. That has slowed tremendously. And um, so I do think that anybody who's like Shanghainese or ABCs who go back to Shanghai, they are, at, or, or even foreigners, Andrew, a lot of foreigners love living in Shanghai, right? I'm saying they're all gonna completely understand what she's saying. However, I do think that it's like, if you're in another city that got the development way later, you might not feel like that. Mm, do you yeah. see what I'm saying? Like Shanghainese are going to feel like their Shanghai is peaked. Yeah, Shanghai is kind of further along in its cycles than other cities in China because Shanghai has been such a great city for so long, for a hundred, a hundred years. Yeah, it was fire in the 1930s. Yeah, it was, it's been like the poppin' city for many, many decades. Been but the now, Seoul or the Tokyo. Or the- but of course, the higher you are, you're going to notice that peak drop-off. I mean, I'm not going to lie, after those second pandemic lockdowns the second one i could see in shanghai in particular because that's not a city that you expected the government to do that in well, typically more western in terms of how i could see how that really broke a lot of spirits and turned a lot of people off you know that that was it was bad i do know a lot i hear that a lot of shanghainese are trying to go to new zealand and australia and different places like that um i will say this just in general though i think that it, it, like i said i think it varies what city you're in if you're like more rural in a city that got less development earlier in china maybe you still feel like it's on the up and up like shenzhen or something like that but i feel like right Right now, the real magic that Shanghai had 15 years ago, Andrew, is in Vietnam and Thailand. Like, that's where just the crazy energy is of, like, everything, just, like, the optimism, everything shooting up. Um, I do think that China's domestic economy is stalling out right now. And I think there's a lot of uh, reasons why. I think you could blame a lot of the leadership. You could blame a lot of, the, you know, like, whether the, the CCP had this... Uh, sort of like legal regulation or that one or overworking the poor people or something like that. I will say this. Um, I think it's very interesting because if you look at East Asia right now, Andrew, they're all sort of running into the unaffordability of cities problems. But this is true across Japan, South Korea, and China. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that they're kind of like all handling it a little bit differently. If you look at Japan, Andrew, they've had a high standard of living for over 60 years now, but they have not had any sort of visible wage increase, Andrew, in Japan for 20 years. Mm. So they're almost like, this sounds like a crazy analogy. You guys, don't be offended. I'm saying they're kind of like committing seppuku right now without just showing a grimace on their face. Like in the sense of like, they're just like vanishing, but they're kind of like, going out without complaining too much. You mean Japan is? Japan is. Yeah. If you look at South Korea, Andrew, a lot of people are complaining about like the 4B movement or just the unaffordability or not wanting to proliferate the culture by population, but they're having a lot of fiery protests. Koreans, very fiery people. Right, right, right. And if you look at China, because protesting is not allowed, everything turns to more internal repression. That is why you get Tangping and Bailan. Mm-hmm. Basically, like, uh, you're like an overworked robot, and you're like, you know, I do have a long-running battery, but still, I need to be recharged, shutting down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would say generally it's in the Chinese uh, culture to, instead of revolt, is just to, like, almost revolt against life and just give up. You right, know, right, right. Because the revolution like against the current government, it's almost impossible to imagine. Yeah, right? that's kind of like how they respond to it. I guess, like... My one thing I would add is like, you know, in the past few decades, China came up. I think it's good. Obviously, it was amazing. Right, but, they got the Xiaomi car now. But people became hyper-materialistic very fast. And I think that that is affecting the younger generation, who, which is a lot of single children. So now you have a bunch of single children who were taught to be hyper-materialistic. And then on social media, all the poor single children are seeing it and they're just like, yo, I, I can't like, I can't compete. I'll never have a life like this. I'm giving up. And uh, maybe right. they're I'm not- making 15 or 14 renminbi an hour. So here, take your card. Like- yeah, so um, it is a tough situation, man. And, and uh, But it's a really big country. So anyways, let's see if people in the comment section have any other insight. Of course, people were talking about different governmental systems. This guy said, democracy is messy, unsatisfying, and slow, but it beats the inevitable greed, power, corruption that a single party system of authority Authoritarianism guarantees. China should try some democracy. 
but the U.S. should too, basically trying to comment on other things. But other people were bringing in this famous British uh, philosopher, Andrew, Alexander Pope. He said, for forms of government, let fools contest this issue. Whatever is the best administered ultimately is the best. So this guy, Alexander Pope, Andrew, was also always saying that, you know how everybody always wants to argue over the system of governance? But he said, whichever one is executed the best, that's just the best one. Dude, that's kind of like how people say, uh, uh, it's not really about the style of martial arts that wins the fight. It's the practitioner. So if you have somebody who's really good at their martial arts versus someone who is not as good at their martial arts. Even if you mean their other, the martial art that they're not a master of is considered like more effective. Yeah, it doesn't fully matter. It's about which one is executed at the higher level. I always say that about basketball too. Let's say, for example, a high pick and roll. You want the big to drop or do you want him to crowd the space of the guard? Well, it just depends. Which one can you do better? It's not about... Yeah. You know, oh, should we play man-on-man -man defense or zone defense? Well, if you can't run a zone, don't do the zone defense. Right. Other people were saying, no, a country of 1.4 billion is ruled over by a single mafia-like party representing 6.7% of the population. That is not right. So I think it's an interesting way. I think... On a more negative side, you could say that China's run like a mafia, but other people I've heard say it's just run like a company or a dynasty. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I don't think America or China's government is executing at the highest level right now. How about that? Right, regardless of system. Just yeah, the execution it, it, flow of whatever setup they got is not good. Yeah. Um. Somebody said it's the Jack Ma situation because Jack Ma was viewed as like the Steve Jobs of China. And then when he got in trouble by criticizing the government, that made everybody go, oh man, that was like our guy we were looking at. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think more for the upper middle class ones, especially too, that are more you know globally and take trips abroad and stuff like that. Somebody said it's actually about the environment. They use they ruin their own environment, so it's actually about the sh lack of greenery and shrubbery that's making people unhappy. That's well, I'm. I think that's a small factor. I, I do think it's true that obviously it's like uh, you know. It ain't Japan, but, you know, they still got some greenery around. But, yeah, it's not Japan. Um, somebody said, guess what? China's not perfect. Newsflash, neither is the USA. We have regular mass shootings, a swelling homeless population, a fractured healthcare system, which uh, and student loans that hobble graduates for a lifetime, and a widening gulf between the mega rich and working poor. Look at our own cities. They're in a perpetual funk, and they just look like Armageddon when you drive through them. So America's got problems, too. I'll tell you this. Everybody's got problems. I'll tell you this. Um, some people are saying Chinese people lack humanity. They have this incredible work ethic, but basically the governmental system is uh, taking the work ethic for granted and not providing enough people with enough spirituality to refill their cup. Mm. I thought that was really interesting. And this is the last comment, Andrew. Very interesting. It says, this is actually a global phenomenon. Most of the first and second world has gotten to the point where people have everything material yet lack a sense of future. What's the future when the major gains are perhaps just a bigger house or maybe a higher tech car? So basically, this malaise is spiritual. It is restlessness and it is global. Mm. This guy said, yep, the world spread malaise is just thanks to the latest stages of capitalism. Asia may have just uh, went through the cycle in a quicker arc. Interesting. Um, ultimately, Andrew, what do you think? I I'll say this. I agree with just Jen in a sense of like when she's speaking exclusively about going to Shanghai and Beijing, it does seem like the mood is like more complaining, I guess, than optimism. But it doesn't mean that it's all bad either because it's like it's not, you know, things are in the gray zone. Listen, man, every country has problems. And depending on who you are in that country, that problem seems like there's no hope but i guess if things run in cycles and everybody's gonna everybody's already peaked and everybody's gonna fall down it's how hard you bounce back up right so i guess it's how do you handle this like i guess inevitable decline it doesn't mean you won't come back up but it's how will you come back up? Right. It's and like how if Steph goes 10 for 10 from three, there's no way he's doing it every game. Yeah, right? how do you handle the slump that you're in? Basically, everybody's in a slump. Japan's in a slump. China's in a slump. USA, right. in for a slump. For all different reasons. Yeah, different reasons. Everybody's in a slump. How do you get out of that slump? How do you deal with it? Everybody's going to go through it, though, and it's going to be painful. So I guess for the individual, how do you uh, just... Uh, how are you going to prepare for the slump? For sure, for sure. But I do think that, obviously, in the Western narrative, if you want to get your 
article published in New York Times, you got to be a little bit, you know, you got to say more one-sided. Right. But who knows? Like I said, like you said, it depends on your individual exposure, but I do know a lot of Chinese trying to go overseas right now, especially the ones with the capacities too. Um, I'll say this, late, late stage capitalism, this is a global thing, man. I always know that people got to believe that the juice is worth the squeeze to buy into capitalism. And the second, like you said, Andrew, social media stars flaunting all this terrible content to get rich and live these terrible degenerate lifestyles, that's going to affect your average worker who doesn't want to show up at the factory anymore. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think in the comment section below. What do you guys think it is? Is it more individual country based or is this a worldwide phenomenon of capitalism? Until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.